All right, good morning, everyone. So glad to see you here today. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, wow, I think they're all asleep. Let's try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, there you are. I can see you, but I couldn't hear you. It's time to be heard. Why don't you all stand with us? We're going to start with a reading of that in the Psalms. Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord, it says, a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods, for the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his court. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Amen.
King Jesus, our Savior, our King, our friend, our Master, we come together in this place today to worship. Lord, worship is not just what we do here on Sunday mornings. Worship is just not what you do when you come to a church building. It's not songs, it's not music, it's not scriptures. Worship is how we are to live our lives. We are to live in worship of the one who created us and saved us and gave us life everlasting with him in eternity. We thank you and praise you for that. And we cannot help but share that, Lord. Give us boldness to look around us and see the hurt and the suffering and the brokenness that's all around us, Lord. We see it on a daily basis. Help us to see with your eyes, Lord. Help us not to walk by. Help us to rely on you to reach out in your name, Lord Jesus, because we want you to be the subject of our lives. Not just when we're here on Sundays, not when just we gather with other people from the church. Lord, we want you to be the subject of our lives always. Lord, we just pray in this time that you would fall on this place with your Holy Spirit in a new and mighty way. Fill this place, Father. Bring us closer together. Fill us with your love for one another. Because that is what the scripture says is what distinguishes us from every other group in the world. Is our love for one another. And they know that we are from you when we love. Not only each other, but when we reach out in love to our neighbors, to our friends, to our enemies, to people that are not very lovely, but we know you love them. And that you loved us when we were far from you. And you've extended us grace. You've extended us mercy. And we want to be the same, Lord. We want to reach out in your name and say, there's hope. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for this time together. Bless every Christian, every child of yours that is worshiping this morning around the world, Lord. No matter what circumstances they may find themselves in, we pray that you would bless the worship that is going up to you this morning. That you would accept it and that it would be pleasing to you. And we pray all these things in the precious, precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
vacation for two weeks, which means I forgot how to take all of this stuff off quickly. And I apologize for that as we stand here awkwardly for a few minutes. But uh, before we get into the message today, today is um, in the life of the church, a day that can often be overlooked or just kind of looked at as uh, one of those things you do. But it's really uh, a big day in the life of, uh, in our case here today, uh, one particular young man. It's a very special day. In fact, for this young man today, he's been looking forward to uh, for quite some time. But now that school is back in session, we have the privilege um, and the honor to go about a promotion today. A promotion today from children's church to youth ministry. It doesn't that even just, it just sounds big, doesn't it? Right? You say that from children's church. Isn't that sounds all soft and sweet? Children's church to youth ministry. Yes, that sounds like pizza. That sounds like 2 a.m. Coca-Cola. That sounds like 24 hours of being awake while the adults are crying in the corner. Amen, amen. Right? But I want to invite Marshall Smith to come up here today with me. Just up here, here in the middle, buddy. It's all right. We, uh, we want to celebrate you today. And uh, because you are growing up into an awesome young man, and we are excited to see all the cool stuff God's going to do with you. And uh, we want to promote you well. So we have a couple of gifts here for you uh, that are just for you. There's uh, just so that you guys know, there's a Bible in there for him and then an extra uh, devotional book uh, geared specifically toward uh, young people, right? Teens and those going into youth ministry. So we're providing that for you so that you can be uh, nourished and fed in these many years to come. I want to take just a minute, if you wouldn't mind, church, I'm going to have Marshall just stay here uh, with me. But I would like for you, if you feel so led and if you feel comfortable to do that, would you come up here as we lay hands on this young man as he embarks this next stage of life and that, that we as the church... Can, uh, can pray over him and that, that God would uh, use him in a powerful way. If you come on up, don't be shy. Marsh, we're going to stand you just right here, okay? Awesome. Thank you, church, for being the church. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today is a day of celebration. It's a day of celebration because you have blessed us with, in this case, Marshall. Thank you for bringing him into our lives. Thank you for bringing him into the life of your church. Lord, thank you for this time and this season that you have ordered and directed just for him. And God, we pray that as he makes this big transition, not just in, from children's church to youth ministry, Lord, but, but now he has made a transition from elementary school to middle school. He's in sixth grade now, and Lord, things begin to change in life and, and circumstances and the people that are around him. And so, Lord, we pray for him today. We pray protection over his life, that as he goes to school, that he would be safe from anyone that would do him any harm whatsoever, that in his coming and going in all of his activities with school or church or even just at home, that you would watch over him and keep him safe in a way that would allow him to grow up into the man that you have created and intended him to be. God, we pray that you would give him wisdom beyond his years, that you would give him peace in the midst of difficult circumstances. We pray, Lord, that you would, would bring about in him a light of Christ that is so bright that others are drawn to you through him. And Lord, above all of these things, we pray that you would use him in a powerful way for your name's sake, for your kingdom purposes. And Lord, we just lift him up to you today, thanking you for him and excited with him about what's in store for 
for his life and youth ministry. God, we pray for Brendan and Jason, too, that as they minister to this young man, that, that they would have the words to speak at just the right time, that their example would not just be felt in a few years of youth ministry, Lord, but in the decades to come, that Marshall would look back fondly on these two individuals who loved him and supported him and encouraged him in his journey with Jesus. Lord, we just lift up our church to you today, that we would come alongside Marshall, that we would love him, that we would encourage him, that we would equip him to be the man God created him to be. Lord, thank you for this young man, and thank you for this opportunity to celebrate today, and all God's people said together, amen. 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 Thank you, church. Thank you, church. It's okay to clap. It is okay to clap. I uh, again, I went, I went on vacation, and that meant that I, uh, well, all my uh, dieting went out the window. I stopped caring the moment I put the car in reverse, uh, <laughs> because you know there's a giant snack bag right there, and uh, you eat that all the way down the road and in the hotel room and anywhere else that you can find a place to eat that stuff. And uh, is anybody else really warm? <laughs> um, or is it just me? Because I, am, I, I was getting a complex up here, just being honest, going, my gosh, how much weight did I put on? Because I'm sweating like a champ <laughs> at this point. So if you see me wiping my brow, uh, or if I pass out, either way, just uh, no, that, no, that's not a God thing. That's just, a, that was probably some Oreos I should have let go. <laughs> Well, let's get into um, this series. <laughs> I laugh at this series because it seems as though we're never going to finish this series. Uh, as we began this series um, weeks ago, um, I ended up getting uh, sick with COVID, as did Marshall, and, and so we ended up not even having worship uh, at all in this place for an entire week, so that backed the series up for a week. And then uh, as I was on vacation, we had the wonderful uh, Reverend Ray Santel who came to preach. Can we, I don't even know if she's watching on our live stream, but Ray, I know you're not feeling good. We love you. We are thankful for you. And can we just give, give a round of applause to Ray? Because she might be here next time on our live stream today. So thankful for her. You know, she came and, and she was all prepped. We talked on the phone. She was excited about these two weeks that she was going to get to preach. And then she got one of them and got sick. And then that backed it up. And then Charles, thank you, Charles, for filling in with very little notice. <laughs> um, and uh, we appreciate you too. Can we thank Charles as well? But there was absolutely no way Charles was going to be able to pick up the ball and run with this series with, uh, you know, less than 24 hours notice. And so uh, we have, are extending this series out beyond the date that we had hoped for. But God is still speaking and moving through it, and it's all going to be all right. So today, let's uh, remind ourselves of our main text that we've been looking at, 10 Signs of a Healthy Church from Acts chapter 2. Verses 42 to 47. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, if you've missed any of these messages at all for the other previous signs, today we're on sign eight. So there are seven other signs that we have addressed so far in this text. You can find them on our social media feed. You can also find them on our YouTube page. Just search for Fellowship Community Church Lincoln when you search for our page there on YouTube. And if you click subscribe, you'll always know uh, when we've posted uh, new material there for you. And you can check those out. Today we're going to look at sign number eight um, because we want to talk about this part of the text that says enjoying the favor of all the people. 
enjoying the favor of all the people. You see, Pentecost had happened just a few weeks prior, right? Or a few days prior, sorry. This is, this is really happening here at the beginning of Acts chapter 1. Is where in the beginning of uh, Acts chapter 2, it's where we find the promised Holy Spirit coming. Jesus told his disciples, go, go pray. Don't do anything else, just go and wait. And my promised gift will come to you. This promised gift of the Holy Spirit. We refer to that as the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came in a powerful way. And fell on each of those men and women. Who were gathered in that upper room together. Praying and waiting for this gift. But it wasn't just about a gift that they got. And they were thankful for it. And the next day they kind of put it on the shelf and forgot it. All about it. You see, when Pentecost came, when the Holy Spirit came, their lives were completely transformed. Everything changed when they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And so that's where we find our text today as we continue to look through these verses in Acts 2. This is, they're having the favor of all the people because the Holy Spirit is alive and well with them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And now we find this group of early disciples, these early believers who were doing their best through the power of the Holy Spirit to live out a very practical life of what it means to follow Jesus. They were really trying to live out what they believed. And the people around them saw it. It was obvious to everybody that came into contact with this early church that, that something had happened. Something had transformed them. There was something that was driving them. Their behaviors, their, their speech, their thought process, all of it was different than everybody else. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came. Because they were living a life as a follower of Jesus Christ, completely devoted to him. And the world saw it. Now, our text says, and they were in favor with all the people. Now, we could say that that's wrong, and we won't do that. However, there's a little hyperbole going on here by using the word all. They were in favor with all the people, but we know they weren't in favor with all the people because there were people waiting outside the doors to kill them. There were people waiting outside the doors to arrest them. There were people waiting out there to get into a fight, to get into an argument. The religious leaders were not thrilled with this first early church. And so when it says the favor of all the people, think about it as like as though you came to church and somebody said you ate all the donuts. You might have had quite a few, but you didn't eat all the donuts. Did you? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. It'll be okay. Right? But there's a little hyperbole going on, and there's nothing wrong with that statement. That is, that is not making this statement false. That is not taking away from the truth of this statement at all. This is simply trying to convey what was really happening here, that this was something so powerful that all the people, right? It was just as far as the eyes could see, too many to count, too many. that were All these things were taking place, and so all the people were just flocking to this early group followers of Jesus Christ, all right? And so sign number eight today is favor with people. Favor with people. Did everybody believe the gospel that heard it from these disciples? No, they didn't. Some still disbelieved. Some still had doubts. Some, some were still in, in, in argument mode about all that they had heard and, and, and what the disciples were claiming that has transpired. So not everybody came to a saving faith in Christ because of the disciples. However, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that something genuine had taken place in their lives. They had been transformed in some way, shape, or form. Even if they couldn't explain it, something was different about them. And that is what brought about the favor 
with the people. So church, we have to ask ourselves as we think about what it means to be a healthy church, can the same be said for us? And remember, this is a building, we are the church. So as we talk about what it means to be a healthy church, we're talking about each other. Right? We're talking about all of those who claim Christ as Lord and Savior. So are we a healthy church? Do we have favor with the people because they can see and notice a radical difference in our lives? Whether they believe in the Jesus part of it or not. Is there some type of transformation that has been in our lives that we are finding favor with people? like they did in the early church. Can the same be said for us today? So I wanna look at three ways that we can examine having favor with the people, grace with the people, an audience with the people, uh, people who are willing to, to at least listen to us, people who will engage in conversation with us as followers of Christ, people who can at least give a good report about who we are, right? Not just the things we do, but who we are. Our character is spoken well of amongst even the unbelievers that might be in our lives, right? Do we have that kind of favor? I'm going to talk about three ways today that we can see the favor in the lives of the early church and, of course, obviously, in Christ as our main example. So here's the first one I want to talk about today. Do we have favor with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Let's start there. Do we have favor with our brothers and sisters in Christ? This group of early followers that we find here in Acts chapter 2, these were men and women. They had come from multiple locations all over the place. They had different backgrounds. They had all kinds of different opinions and thoughts and upbringings. And yet, they were known for their love for one another. They absolutely loved one another. There was no doubt, even the people that wanted to kill them knew that they loved one another, right? In fact, Jesus told us this in John chapter 13. Nicole so beautifully prayed about this today. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, can we just pause right there for a minute? By this, Jesus says, it's not about the car you drive. It's not about the job that you have. It's not about the clothes that you wear. It's not about the church that you go to. It's not about how big or how small the church that you go to is. It's not about the style of music that your church plays on Sunday morning that makes you better or less than than the other group. Jesus said it's about our love for one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another another. You see, this early church, they had favor with each other. They were giving each other grace upon grace upon grace. They, they were walking alongside each other as they were all being transformed together. And there were some that were a little slower in the class, amen, <laughs> right, than the rest of them. And, and, and you know what? It was all good. It was all good because they had favor with one another, because they were loving one another, because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, which is what allowed that to take place in the first place. You see, it wasn't about them going, hey, um, Jesus said, I got to love you, so I'm going to try really hard. That doesn't work, does it? If you've been alive longer than 10 minutes, you know that that does not work. That's simply trying to modify our own behavior. That's us trying in our own strength and our own power to do that. When you get people together who have different thoughts and opinions and backgrounds, oh my goodness gracious, it takes divine intervention in order for that to go well. Amen. Have you seen social media, right? 
right? But listen, listen, this, this early church, they had different political opinions. They had different skin tones. They, they came from all kinds of different places. They had different types of food that they liked to eat. They were diversified like crazy, and yet they were known for their love for one another because they were favoring one another, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, transforming them in a way that was completely visible. And I, I, I gotta tell you, church, I, I think the world looks at us today as the church, right? I'm not speaking just to us here. I'm talking about the church. The church that spends its time fighting with one another. Oh my goodness. You, you, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a, there's actually a, a, a term that they use for this on Twitter specifically. They call it Christian Twitter. Christian Twitter is where Christians get together and they battle back and forth and back and forth and back and forth about their theological beliefs that are secondary or maybe even third or fifth or 27th on the list of things that actually matter. And they argue and they fuss and they fight and they complain about it. They refer to it as Christian Twitter. Wow. Wow, that's, that's what we're known for. Holy cow. But God's people, known for being people who argue and fight with one another. God's people, known for being the biggest gossips in town. If you doubt me, go ask some of your unsafe friends. If they're honest with you, they will tell you. This is what the church is known for, right? And so we have to shift. We have to have the paradigm changed. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God so that we might look, behave, Think and talk like Jesus commanded us to. That we might then begin to find favor with the people outside the four walls of our church buildings. There was an early uh, church father, his name was Tertullian. Tertullian uh, was alive actually just uh, about a hundred years or so after the book of Acts was written, okay? And here's what, here's what Tertullian said. He said, our care for the derelict and our active love have become our distinctive sign before the enemy. See, they say, how they love one another and how ready they are to die for each other. Oh, what a beautiful statement that is. The enemy of the church, would they knew that those people, those Jesus followers over there, they loved each other to the point that they would die for each other. Their love was that great. And even though the enemy disagreed with their religious beliefs and the ways that they carried all of that out, there was absolutely no doubt in their eyes and in their hearts that something was different about the church. We must get back to this place that we have love for one another, that we find favor in our, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our example to the world depends on it. Here's the second point I want to make today. Do we have favor with the next generations? Do we have favor with the next generations? In case you didn't know already, this is a big deal to Jesus. If you don't know anything about Jesus, please know that Jesus loves children. Jesus prioritized children and young people. In Matthew chapter 18, this is what's happening. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? All right, so let's pause right here for a second just so we can understand that the disciples... We're all about themselves. 
completely focused on themselves, their needs, their wants, their desires, their plans, the whole kit and caboodle. It goes on to say, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand how powerful that statement is? Do you understand the impact that, that Jesus is, has made in this conversation as, as he pulled a child, children seen as less than in a, in a culture? Some things never change, do they? Children are to be seen and, and not heard. Children are, are, are just supposed to eventually grow up and then they'll be useful when they can come alongside the adults and do the adult things. Jesus grabs one of those children and he pulls them right into the center of the conversation and says, this, my friends, is who you need to become. Powerful statement from Jesus. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Do you get it today, church? That as we pray for Marshall in this promotion thing, that Jesus was standing in the middle of that whole thing? That as we pray for, for his a blessing upon his life, as we pray for, for his future, we were praying about Jesus. You see, because Jesus is with the children. When we welcome the young people, we're welcoming Jesus. It's so important. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. How often do we cause the next generations to stumble? Because we, as God's people, are focused on ourselves. Because we, as God's people, have not yet surrendered all of us, our entire life, heart, mind, body, soul, the whole thing to Christ so that we might be filled with his Holy Spirit to have ears that hear like him, to have eyes to see like him, that, that take hands and feet and put them into practice like Jesus would. How many times do we cause young people to stumble in the life of the church? I, I hope you hear my passion as I speak about this today, because I'm going to be honest with you today. I've been on the receiving end of the church as a young person, as a, as, as a, as a child of Marshall's age and, and, and even a little bit older. I was told by a Sunday school teacher that I would never amount to anything. They had special board meetings at my church because of the clothes that I wore on Sunday morning. They didn't want to hear anything at all about my music because that would mean it would change. And for years, I ran away from the Lord. And as far from church people as I could go. But by the grace of God. By the grace of God. He came into my life. And he showed me what it's supposed to look like. And he gave me the grace and the ability and the power to forgive and to move on. But he also put that in my heart to see that that never happens to a young person again. Ever. You see, our next generations have been crying out for decades 
church. Decades to us. They've been trying to communicate to, to us as the church. And we are turning deaf ears and blind eyes to their circumstances and to what they're actually trying to tell us. You see, church, our churches are not devoid of young people just because of music preferences. They're devoid of young people because they weren't welcomed. They weren't loved. They weren't nurtured. They weren't invited. They weren't included. They weren't heard. They weren't given the abilities to speak and to serve and to come alongside. And they said, that's not what I see in Scripture and I don't want any part of it. So church, we've got to ask ourselves, are we full of the Holy Spirit of God that's transforming us in such a way that the next generations want to be a part of what God's doing in us and through us? And are we going to allow ourselves to be transformed in such a way that we who are older in our years are willing to get out of God's way and let the young people fulfill the calling that God has placed on their life? Amen. That's what a healthy church looks like. That's what you and I as a healthy church is what it looks like. Our, our, our younger generations have grown very weary of seeing mom and dad or grandma and grandpa go to church on Sunday mornings and live like hell Monday through Saturday. They're tired of it. They're tired of the hypocrisy. Listen, they're not asking for perfection. I've got two young boys in my house. One is 12 and one just turned 17. They're not, they've never asked me for perfection, but they always ask me for authenticity. They do expect integrity from me, right? That's what they're after. And when we come to church and pretend on a, on, for, for a couple of hours on a Sunday and live something totally different, oh God, church, would we repent and fall on our faces and ask God to forgive us because we are causing the next generations to stumble with our behavior. They're tired of inauthentic uh, people. They're, they're tired of negativity. Oh my gosh, do you understand that these younger generations do not see the world falling apart like you do? In fact, they have hope for the future because they know they get to be a part of it. These younger generations want to change the world. They want to change the world. So we have got to stop telling them that the world is crap. We are discouraging our young people on a daily basis with our negativity. Young people do not need to be nor want to be talked down to. Can I tell you this? Our young people are ready to have some truly deep spiritual content in their life. My oldest son is a senior in high school. And homeboy is getting ready to take, was it pre-calculus? If he can take pre-calculus, he can handle a Bible study with some actual content. He can handle some challenging conversations because they're already having them in their hallways and their schools. So just maybe we need to teach our young people how to invite Jesus into those conversations. The difference that Jesus makes in those conversations. We spent so long in the life of the church trying to tell everybody this is what you're supposed to believe. And we made it like a checkbox. If you believe this and this and this, then you fit in our box and you're welcome to be here. But we never told anybody the difference it made. We never told anybody how to take it and actually make it applicable to their everyday life. And our young people are crying out for that today. Will we come alongside them 
and do so. I promise you this church, if we are willing to do the hard work, if we are willing to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, to, to surrender to what he wants to do, I promise you there are young people all over the world that you will begin to find favor with because you will be different than everybody else. And it will be attractive and it will draw people unto you. Not because you are great, but because Jesus is great through you. They're ready. The next generations are ready. And they're tired of not being on mission. That's the last thing I'll say about that. They're tired of not being on mission. They don't want to come to church with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa and hear people talk about the things that we're supposed to be doing. They want to go do it. They want to go do it. They want to be the ones working the booth at the car show with Lincoln Northeast when we set up out there. They want to be putting together popcorn bags for, for, for an event going on. They want to serve the community. They want to be involved in, in, in all the aspects of our ministry that we're talking about. They want that. And if it's not there, they won't be a part of it. The young generations want to be on mission. They've read scripture. They've read it enough to know what Jesus is like and what he's calling his church to be. And even though they don't have it all figured out, they're willing to give it a try. Are we gonna be willing to find favor with the next generations? Here's the last thing I'll say. It's the last point I mean. Favor with the world around us. Do we have favor with the world around us? In Matthew 19, starting in verse 10, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house. Now Matthew was a tax collector that ended up getting called to be a disciple of Jesus. Don't, don't misunderstand. We don't, we don't like that particular revenue agency that exists in our culture today. I'm saying it carefully in case they're listening to the live stream. Right? We, we don't like that agency at all. April 15th is, 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 a, is like doomsday, right? Nobody likes that day. They really didn't like the tax collectors in this day and in this culture because these tax collectors were selling out their own people, manipulating their own people, taking two, three, four, five times more than was necessary from their own people. You want to talk about being despised. Be a tax collector. In the first century, that's Matthew. Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, that's the religious leaders, by the way, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? They said that with a nasty, curled up face. You know what I'm talking about, right? You've made it a time or two. Like that somebody got a hold of some bad onions. That face. But Jesus heard it. He said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And all God's people said, duh. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That was our Jesus. Our Jesus had the reputation amongst the religious elite for being hanging out with the wrong crowd. They called him a drunkard and a glutton. That's what they called Jesus. You don't get called a drunkard and a glutton unless you're hanging around some pretty sweet parties. But that's our Jesus. Jesus was where the broken people were. Jesus was where the discouraged people were. Jesus was where the people who were the outcasts were. That's where Jesus spent his time and all throughout the Gospels. Pick a spot, you just find crowds of people, poor people and rich people, 
Healthy people, sick people, everybody in the world was drawn to Jesus. Now, they may have been drawn for a variety of reasons. That's not the point. The point is they were drawn to Jesus. Church, are they drawn to us? Is the world drawn to us in the same way? And if the answer to that question is no, then I've got to challenge each one of us, myself included. Do we look like Jesus then? Are we where the brokenness is? Are we willing to get our hands dirty and get in the side of the road and sit in the ditch with somebody? Because Jesus did. And our world today sees the absence of that. And there's so many people today I know that are, are, are claiming that the church is being persecuted right now. I got to tell you right now, that's a bold place lie. The church is not being persecuted. The church is being called out for her hypocrisy. The church is being called out by the world today that we are not living up to what they know Jesus called us to. And so how, how can we begin to be transformed so that the world around us would find favor with us? There was a, an emperor about 300 years after the book of Acts was written. His name was Julian the Apostate. That's a good name. Julian the Apostle. He says, the godless Galileans, that would be the Christians. Okay? The, and he calls them godless because they weren't worshiping all the gods that everybody else was. They just had Jesus. And Jesus was the subject. Right? They had thousands upon thousands of gods. So they call them the godless Galileans. They feed not only their poor, but ours also. Those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render to them. Holy cow. Is that a beautiful picture of the church or what? The world around them knew it. Man, our leaders, our government, our, our people can't even provide food for us. If we can go to those church people, they're going to take care of us. They're going to love us. They're going to provide for our needs. Oh, if the, if the world would be able to say that again today. How can we begin to find favor with the world around us? It starts with surrendering ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God to transform us. We might see people the way God sees people. There was a, a book a while back called Blue Like Jazz. Blue, like the color blue. Blue Like Jazz. And it was written by a guy named Donald Miller. And in this book, he was talking about um, there was a, an opportunity where there were some people that recognized how the church had failed the world in loving it well and serving it well. And, and so what they did is they had this crazy idea. They got a group of Christians together and they went to Portland, Oregon. Now, if you want to talk about a city that would be considered a very secular city, um, maybe even um, maybe even anti-Christian to, to a point, right, it would be Portland, Oregon. And so they went to this college, I believe it was called uh, Reed College in Portland. And what they did was they built a confessional booth, <laughs> a little confessional booth right in the middle of the campus. And they invited all of the atheist classmates to come and sit and listen to the confessions of the Christians. Just sit and listen to the confession of Christians that were coming to the booth. And there was a young man that, that came and uh, he couldn't believe that this was going to happen. And, and so he's like, and the, the, so the first Christian guy comes up and he says, I'm, I'm here to confess. And he says, confess what? And the young man just kept going. He goes, well, there's a lot, but I'm going to try to keep it short. And, and, and he ended up saying, Jesus said to feel the, feed the poor and heal the sick. And I've never done much about that. 
Jesus said to love those who persecute me. And I tend to lash out, especially if I feel threatened. And Jesus said not to mix spirituality with politics. And I grew up doing that. And it got in the way of the message of Christ. And then he went on and he talked about the Crusades and he, and he talked about slavery. He, he talked about treatment of, of the Native Americans. And, and, and the guy said, finally, an atheist friend said with tears in his eyes, he said, it's all right, man. I forgive you. And by the time the little party that they were throwing was over, the Christians had confessed the sins of the church to dozens of people. Out of that confession came four Bible studies, <coughs> ongoing relationships, and numerous people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I don't mean to sound negative today. I don't mean to be a doomsday or today at all, but the world is not looking fondly upon the church. It was a Gandhi that said, you're Jesus I like, your followers not so much. There was a movie made that said, Lord, save us from your followers. Right? And like all of these things exist. Maybe the church needs to come to Christ, receive grace for the forgiveness of her sins, and humbly ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, to be transformed from the inside out, not to do different, but to be different, to become who God intended her to be. Only then will we begin to find favor with the world around us. We can't keep being hateful on social media. We can't keep <laughs> worshiping at the altar of our political parties or our favorite news channels. The list of things that the people around us think of when they think of the church are things like bigot, hypocrite, anti-homosexual, we may have a sexual ethic that we follow one man, one woman in marriage forever. I get that. I'm not discounting that at all. We're not saying we're going to throw away that belief. But when, when people who are practicing homosexuality feel that they are ostracized and uncared for and unloved by the church, maybe we missed. Maybe we missed. Maybe we didn't love like Jesus. How can we begin to do that again? I just want to invite us, maybe today you're here and, and you've been a part of the church, God's church for, for some time, and, but you don't know Jesus. You know a lot about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. Jesus isn't the subject of your life. Jesus isn't dictating your schedule. Jesus isn't dictating your thought process. I want to invite you to come to know Jesus today. He is full of grace and mercy and love. And he wants to welcome you with open arms. Would you find Jesus today? He's here. He's here with arms wide open, ready to accept you. If you will surrender your life to him. In church, maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, but you need a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit of God a fresh filling of his Holy Spirit in your life. Maybe you need to confess a few things that you've been hanging on to or areas of your life that you've been, been trying to keep him away from so he won't touch it. All of that today, the Holy Spirit wants to meet you so that you and God's church might find favor with those around you. That he might receive all the glory and all of the honor that is due his name. Then, and only then, will we begin to see those added to our number daily who are being saved. The altars are up here at the front if you'd like to come pray. I'm going to have our praise team make their way back up.
If you want to pray all by yourself and you just want to be left alone, just you and the Lord, you want to humble yourself, come over here to, to my left and you can just pray there and nobody will bother you. If you want somebody to pray with you, you need somebody to pray with you, come over here to my right and, and we would be honored to kneel with you and uh, walk alongside you with whatever's on your heart, however the Holy Spirit speaks. Will you surrender your life to Jesus today? Will you be filled with the Holy Spirit of God today so that you may become the healthy church he created you to be? Pray with me. Our Lord and our God, we look at them in amazement at what you did in Acts chapter 2. Lord, you're the same. You're the same God today as you were then, because you were the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your gift of the Holy Spirit is still promised to us too. Lord, all we have to do is give you our life. Surrender ourselves to you. Humble ourselves before you. Put ourselves in your hands to be used. And you'll meet us right there. So God, today we pray that you would transform us. That we would care about the things that you care about. That we would be known, even here at Fellowship Community Church, God, that we would be known in this city as the church where they love one another. That we would be known, Lord, as the church that cares about the next generations. Lord, we want to be known as people transformed by you and filled with your Holy Spirit. We want to be different. We want to see the promises of Scripture fulfilled in our lives. But we can't do it without you. So Lord, we pray that you would meet us where we are right now in this place. And as we continue to worship, that your Holy Spirit would guide, direct, convict, and change. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your grace and your love. Amen. Can you please stand with us for our prayer? And please feel free to come down and pray in this prayer and song if you'd like. Just again, he's here and he's waiting. We sing a song about the reckless love that he gave to us that we didn't deserve, we didn't earn, and that we are to take and show to others around us. That love for each other that is so important that he gave to us.
Yes. I remember what they are. So perfect. Okay. We again, uh, the giving is an act of worship, and uh, we we appreciate the tithes and the offerings and the sacrifice of God's people because it's what allows us to carry out the mission that God has called us to. So. For those of you who are so faithful in your giving, we thank you, and may God continue to bless you for that. Uh, you're able to give. We have all kinds of options, whether you use the QR codes in the back of the chairs, whether it's text to give, whether it's old school, just dropping an envelope in the, the box at the back of the sanctuary uh, or the lobby. Either way, we try to make that as convenient for you uh, as we can so that you can participate in that act of worship as well. If you're here for the first time, or maybe the first time in a really long time, we'd love to hear from you. Say hello, fill out the digital connect card. Just text hello to the number on the screen, and, uh, and you can do that. You can also stop by and see me at the Welcome Center uh, when we're all finished. I'd love to just be able to shake your hand and say hello and thank you for coming as well. If you're on our live stream and this is the first time for you, you can also text hello that way too. We would love to reach out to you. Shoot us a private message. Uh, we would love to talk with you and pray for you however we might be able to do that. Also, uh, we have a special pool party tonight from 5 until 8 o'clock for youth ministry. So youth ministry will not be happening here at the building. It's going to happen around the pool. Does that sound like a good time or what? Hey, Marsh, you picked the perfect time to join me in the <laughs> You are brilliant, my man. I love it. I love it. Five to eight. Now, this is actually going to be taking place at the home of Jerry and Pam Owen. They have opened up their pool uh, for our youth tonight. If you have no idea where that is or who those people are, uh, stop and see me at the Welcome Center. Or uh, Jason and Brenda are right over here. Would you guys raise your hands just real quick because we love attention. Perfect. Brenda got to go a little higher than that because I'm the only one that saw that. That was good. That was good. The, that fingernail polish, that belongs to Brenda Johnson. And you guys can talk to them, too, uh, about getting hooked up with information you need uh, for tonight's youth ministry from 5 to 8 around the pool. Next Sunday, special speaker, uh, my dear friend Todd Brashner is going to be here. He's going to continue our series next week uh, and talk about the aspect of worship as we find it in the Acts chapter 2 text. But he's also going to be spending some time on Saturday uh, with our worship team and just pouring into them and spending some time with them, investing in them to help them to continue to be able to use the gifts and talents that God has given them uh, and to a way in a way that just brings God glory and honor and also brings about excellence in their ministry. Uh, and we're excited for that uh, to taking place as well. Our growth groups are How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. We just started this past Wednesday with the first week. If you did not sign up for this one, but you really think you want to, you can come on in. We'll get you caught up. If you get too much further past this, you may find yourself behind uh, and find yourself frustrated. But if you're free on Wednesday evenings for the next few weeks, 7 o'clock, we'd love to have you be in a part of this particular growth group. And then what else is next? We got God Space, which if you've ever wondered how in the world do I have spiritual conversations with people in my life without sounding like a buffoon and all awkward, then this is the growth group for you. We want to uh, give you some tools and some practical ways uh, that you can go about having those kinds of conversations uh, with people in your life. That growth group will be starting on Sunday evenings on September the 11th. And then Jennifer and I are uh, starting our first community group here, a home-based small group. We still have room for just a couple more people if you would like to participate. This will be starting on September 12th and will be on Monday evenings from 6 until 8. This is going to be us living out Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. We're going to be praying together. We're going to be studying together. We're going to be eating food together. We're going to be laughing together. We're going to be serving the community together. So if you want to be a part of that, we would love to have you. A couple of quick caveats. One, just know I got a dog. You kind of got to be okay with that. We'll lock her up the best we can, but she's still a dog. Uh, also, you need to be able to do steps because our home is on the second level. It's 17 steps to get into our place. Just FYI, if steps are not your friend, we'll catch you with another uh, community group uh, down the road. But that's important. As well. So stop by and see me. Uh, I'll go up and center if you'd like uh, to sign up for any of that, or if you have any questions at all, or if we can just talk and say hello, that would be awesome too. So, church, would you stand to your feet because you have been the recipient of the reckless love of God? 
You have heard about his grace and his mercy. And he wants to have, for you to have favor with the people in your life. So will you take the good news and spread it to somebody this week? Go in the name of Jesus and in the power of his Holy Spirit. You are loved and dismissed.